I apologize for my slightly Hezbollah appearance. <laughs> but I was told in my recent voyage to Iran that the more scruffy I looked, the more plausible I would appear, and the um, easier it would be to go to things like Friday prayers. And, and so it proved. Um, it's, a, it's a country for the scruffy. It's kind of my, kind of, my kind of Middle East. By going to um, Iran, a country I'd had a great difficulty getting a visa for for many, many years, um, I think I've become the only person who has, since the year 2000, been on the ground in North Korea, in Iraq, and in Iran. In other words, I, I may now have a stump speech that I can go around giving. And this is my prototype for it, as a matter of fact, um, why I suggested that we might discuss this famous question of the axis of evil and what it means, or what different things it might cover. Um, but I want to back up a little um, to a, a, about a decade ago, perhaps a little more, um, the mid-90s and um, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Kosovo, where I also spent some time. I've never actually added up the exact number of days, but and it strikes me looking out at you now that a lot of you are terrifyingly young and may not even remember what it was like to live in the last months of 1989, or not remember it very clearly. But for those of us of my age, and even quite a lot younger, the sense of human emancipation that occurred with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the implosion of the ossified form of Russo-communism that had been imposed on Eastern and Baltic Europe, and some of Balkan Europe, uh, that, that sense is something I can still very vividly call to mind. Um, I was in Romania at the time it actually happened, watching the overthrow of the Ceausescu regime, which was perhaps the most brutal uh, and corrupt, as well as the, most, um, the one that was most centered on a cultic personality. And it wasn't just that it was extraordinary to see uh, so many millions of people in so many different countries and, and societies simply by folding their arms and adopting an attitude of defiance, revolutionizing and changing their system. It wasn't that it, was, that it was so moving to see that. It was the realization that the Cold War was over in the other way, too. That it, was, that it was quite likely now that we would not have to think every day of the possibility of a mistake or a crime or a blunder leading to what was euphemistically called in my, my hometown of Washington, D.C., a nuclear exchange. Imagine, imagine thinking of a thermonuclear holocaust as an exchange, but that was the way we tried to make the thought go away. It was, it was a, an extraordinary period. Um, and in those days, some of you will remember, and you can look it up, there was talk of a peace dividend, um, of, the, of the possibility of transferring the enormous resources that we've been putting into warfare into peaceful projects and into doing something about the real victims of the Cold War who were the inhabitants of the countries we used to call the Third World. Uh, that there would, there would be possibly a new internationalism, uh, a new comity internationally, uh, a new renunciation of force, some spare money, and, and a common feeling that the values of pluralism and democracy were worth having for their own sake and had, so to speak, proved their worth in ideological combat against both fascism and Stalinism. It was, a, it was a blissful time to be around, I tell you. That's November the 9th, call it. That, that's the day the Berlin Wall fell. Ceausescu fell actually not till Christmas Day, or Christmas Eve in, in Bucharest. So uh, that's the end of 1989. The 2nd of August, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Actually, it's not really st strictly true to say that he invaded Kuwait. He annexed Kuwait. He announced that Kuwait was part of Iraq. He did something that had never been tried before, abolished the existence of a member state of the United Nations, a fellow Muslim state, and member of the Arab League. But quite an extraordinary thing to have done. And around that time, um, Slobodan Milosevic uh, tried to impose the idea of a national socialist, Greater Serbia, on his neighbors in first Slovenia, uh, then Croatia, then most heinously in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and then in Kosovo, and suddenly it, it hit me. Uh, I, had, I shouldn't have been part of this naive chorus about the end of history and the peace dividend. I had some reservations about it, which I published, but I, I had shared in the general 
optimism. Of course we were not yet out from under uh, the rule or the danger that is posed by psychopathic dictatorship. So I had to spend a lot of time, first in uh, northern Iraq and Kurdistan, and then in Sarajevo and, and Mostar, um, witnessing what happens when dictators are allowed to get their way. And the shameful thought that one had about it was that in, in both cases, the cases of Saddam Hussein and Slobodan Milosevic, they had been allowed to get away with the impression that they were thought of by Western democratic societies as allies, even sometimes as clients, or if one couldn't go quite that far, as necessary partners for negotiation. And in fact, Milosevic, I remember being called by the Clinton administration, a partner in peace, as when he came, he deigned to come to sign the Dayton Accords with them. Um, um, don't let me forget his name, uh, Mr. Clinton's negotiator, Richard Holbrook. Holbrook thank you. Um, uh, uh, although we, uh, Mr. Holbrook had to grant Milosevic immunity from prosecution to land on an American Air Force base, and this immunity was granted him, I felt that was a moment of shame. And I began to evolve the following view of it. Uh, coexistence with psychopathic dictatorships is in fact not possible. And that is a good thing, probably, because it, nor is it desirable. Um, two or three years after Milosevic had been called a partner in peace at Dayton, he, one of his other conditions, as well as not being arrested, was that the name Kosovo not be mentioned in any of the conversations, that the subject not be brought up. That was acceded to as well by an administration so eager to declare a peaceful victory. Um, he had to be, in effect, evicted from power in his own country, um, just as those who he had evicted from their homes in Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo had to be forcibly taken home and his ethnic cleansing undone. Uh, or in all the years that were spent in trying to contain or even to coerce or to civilize or domesticate this man had been wasted. They had, in fact, all been exploited by him uh, to advance his program of uh, his mad idea of, uh, of a greater Serbia. And the same had been true every time people had ever tried to make nice with Saddam Hussein. Uh, it, it seemed that his appetite for power only grew uh, with the eating. And then in a country that most people hadn't been thinking about, uh, in Rwanda, um, a, a, a racist party decided that it could bring about a final solution to its, the problem of its racism, namely the extermination of the members of the other tribe and of the members of its own tribe who were against genocide. And they knew by this stage, they knew that they could do this uh, without the danger or even the threat or the risk of uh, foreign intervention or any resistance to their, to their planned program of extermination. And they were right. And meanwhile, in North Korea, the war, the war that never stopped, North Korea is still officially at war with the United States. We are, we are only in an armistice period, a period of armistice that was, um, I say we, you'll pardon me. Uh, the United States is only um, in a state of armistice and armed truce with North Korea ever since the armistice of 1951. Uh, it, it seemed that uh, yet another state of the one party and the one man and the one ideology uh, wanted to become grander still by the acquisition of weapons of mass destruction. Well, I don't need to tell you how the last few years have been completely consumed by uh, this question and for how to uh, address and approach it. And I, I'll give you, if I may, give you three brief capsules, first from uh, Iraq, <clears throat> and then from North Korea, and then from, from Iran. I think the way I would want to put it about the atmosphere in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, the way that it would be, is most memorable to me, I will, I will hope will, will be uh, memorable to you too. If you go to El Salvador, say, or South Africa, or Poland, um, or former Yugoslavia, you can meet people who were heroic members of the opposition in the bad old days, and they can tell you terrible stories about what happened to them and to their families. But what I noticed about Iraq was not just that every Iraqi or, and Iraqi Kurd that I knew could tell a terrible story about what had happened to him, self or herself, or their families, but everybody I knew who'd been a member or supporter of the government could tell the same story of how their families had disappeared 
or how they themselves have been arrested for no reason and, and brutally tortured. I knew, for example, quite well a man called Marzin Zahawi. He was Saddam Hussein's personal interpreter in English. He spoke English faultlessly. He was half Kurdish and he was, 100, I think, 100% gay, which is a risky position already to have in, um, in, in Saddam's Iraq. And he privately produced a tape of um, the play of the importance of being earnest with himself in the part of Lady Bracknell, a, a remarkable chap, um, and was always at the side of the leader. Um, but unfortunately, he had to be at the side of the leader when, after the invasion of Kuwait, foreign leaders flew into Baghdad to reproach Mr. Saddam Hussein, to upbraid him, to urge him to get out of Kuwait while there was still time, to obey the resolutions and to avoid a war. Many of them spoke to him rather brusquely. And Saddam Hussein doesn't like being spoken to brusquely by anybody. No mafia chieftain will be insulted in front of his underlings. And those who were in the room who'd had to see it happen, namely the interpreter, I think must have known at that moment that they were going to die because they'd seen something they weren't supposed to see. And though everyone had known all the time that Marzin was Kurdish and gay, it hadn't been held against him, particularly he was too useful. Suddenly it was announced that these things made him a, a traitor. And he was torn to death, uh, torn to pieces in a, in a dungeon um, in ways that I, I won't bother to, to, to detail to you. Um, another friend of mine, Naji Sabri Hadithi, the last foreign minister of Saddam's Iraq, who I'd met originally when he ran the Iraqi Cultural Center in London, he rose to be foreign minister by means of being the editor of the uh, Baghdad Daily, which was the job of his in the meantime. One of his brothers was ambassador to Moscow, for Iraq, was recalled from Moscow, tortured to death, with no charges, no explanation, nothing ever said. And uh, the foreign minister's other brother was recalled from another post and tortured not quite to death. And he went out to be Saddam's foreign minister as a broken man. He went out to represent the man who had mutilated his family. Uh, psychopathic, sadistic dictators like to do this to people. They like to show who's boss. People often use the word systematic when they talk about repression or, or abuse of human rights. They say these things are systematically abused. Of course, that's a correct way of understanding it, but it misses a certain point. It must be unsystematic also. It must be capricious. It must be unpredictable. Nobody must know that they're safe. Nobody can think, now. I now have passed all the tests that make me a loyal member of the Ba'ath Party. I'm, I'm going to be all right. They will, they will never be allowed to get to that moment. The, the fear, the Republic of Fear, as my friend Kanan Makia described it in his brilliant profile about this, must always be maintained. Uh, for example, when Saddam, uh, you can, there's even a video of this, you can, you can get it if you want. When he purged the party, he had the room full of the Central Committee, probably about as full as this one is. And then someone is brought in to make a confession, an obviously broken person who sobs a confession into a microphone standing there haggardly and starts reading out a list of the names of the traitors who are in the plot and they're in the audience and they're pointed to and the guards come and take them away one by one. And nobody in the room knows if they're on the list yet themselves. The people begin to weep and scream and cry and make hysterical declarations of love and adulation for Saddam Hussein even as they're vomiting and excreting with, with fear. And then it's over and the ones who are in the plot have been dragged out of the room. And then the video comes to an end. And there's a second half, which I haven't seen. It's harder to get. But the people who survive then have to go out into the courtyard and shoot their former colleagues who were found to be part of the conspiracy. Uh, that's a, a detail that, as Kanan Makir says, neither Stalin nor Hitler ever thought of doing that. That's a special twist, a, little, a, a, a detail, an exquisite addition, if you, if you like, uh, for showing who's in power and for making an accomplice of everyone who serves you for dirtying them up, as the mobsters would say. I don't tell you this because I'm interested in the pornography of a dictatorship, though I am. I tell you that because I could find people all over um, Washington, D.C., who would nonetheless say to me, well, Saddam may be a bad guy. By the way, anyone who starts a sentence saying that, you know immediately, knows and cares nothing about Iran. But Saddam may be a bad guy, they would say. I hope none of you have ever said it, and I hope if you hear people saying it from now on, you'll challenge it. He may be a bad guy, the argument went on, but he's, he's a realist. He understands containment. He understands self-preservation. He understands uh, self-interest. Not so, not so at all. It was quite evident to me, you know, to anyone who had tasted what the atmosphere of Iraq inside was like and seen the mass graves, 
and heard the stories that here was a man who was quite obviously delusional and who had around him, for reasons which must be obvious to you by now if they weren't before, no one who would tell him he was making a mistake. For him to invade Kuwait was an extraordinary mistake. For him to refuse to get out, thinking he'd get away with it, showed that he must have lost control of his senses. He was visited, or his foreign minister was summoned, rather, uh, by James Baker just before the coalition intervention began. Tariq Aziz was handed a, a note in, in Vienna, I believe it was, or perhaps a Zurich. He was told, since you're not going to leave Kuwait, we're going to throw you out. You've run, you've run out your clock. But <clears throat> that's not all. If you do any of three things, uh, we will consider ourselves uh, freed from all military restraint. And everybody knows what that means when the United States says it. We'll deny ourselves no course of action. Any one of these three things. If you set fire to the Kuwaiti oil fields, or try to destroy the Kuwaiti oil industry on your way out, if you do that, if you sabotage it, we will consider ourselves not bound by the UN resolutions. If you uh, use international terrorism against us and try and open a second front of that kind, the same applies. Um, and if you use chemical or biological weapons on our forces. Now, we don't know, I at any rate don't claim to know, what the um, Gulf War syndrome that affects so many soldiers actually is. But it, isn't, it is consistent with the, at least the possibility that some local commanders of Saddam Hussein's were allowed to, enabled to, permitted to use nerve weapons in the field. It's, it's not to be excluded. It, I won't say it can be asserted. <clears throat> it's worth bearing in mind. It is beyond doubt that in the, on his way out of Kuwait, where he had nothing to lose and nothing to gain, um, quite pointlessly, viciously, Saddam Hussein ordered not just the ignition of the oil fields, but the smashing of the, well, of the heads of the oil wells so that the oil would run straight into the Gulf, which it did. It was thought at one point it would take 10 years to clean it up. And it destroyed almost all the marine and bird life of the area, as well as causing a, an, an appalling conflagration that raged for several months before. This will depress some of you. It was put out by Halliburton, by Kellogg, Brown, and Root, um, rather more quickly than that. Sorry to break the news, but there it is. Um, and um, the following year, when George Bush made a visit to Kuwait, George Bush Sr. made a visit to Kuwait to celebrate, as it were, uh, the anniversary of the liberation, an Iraqi death squad was caught red-handed trying to kill him. Imagine if they'd succeeded. So that you had a dictator who was actually insanely and obscenely rash, and whose movements could not be predicted, and whose sense of self-preservation was extremely fragile and his hold on reality had largely gone. And it's for this reason, and for his continued interest in weapons of mass destruction and the sponsorship of terrorism, that it seems to me that it was long overdue to remove him from power, and that the year to have done that would have been 1991. And it's, uh, it's a shame and a disgrace to the civilized world, in my opinion, that it allowed continued coexistence, continued survival to this regime and wasted a dozen years of the lives of the Iraqi people, which were consumed by the locust. But I, I, I dare say people will want to ask me about that. Um, when I went to Pyongyang in North Korea and started tra traveling as far as I could outside the capital city, though no journalist has ever been allowed to go off on their own in North Korea, and I don't think ever will be, and in any case, it's a law in Korea that no Korean is allowed to speak to a foreign visitor. Um, so it's hardly necessary to prevent journalists from trying to talk to them, because you can see in the face of any North Korean, if you can get that near them, that they, they'll back away frightened. They know they're not supposed to. One therefore can't give you quite as many anecdotes about what the texture of everyday life is. However, I... I'm one of those authors who does their best to wage a war on cliché. I went to Prague once under the days of the old Stalinist regime, and I thought, whatever happens to me on this visit, I am not going to mention Franz Kafka. I'm going to be <laughs> the first writer to report from communist Prague who doesn't have Kafka in the piece. Well, that, I know going in. Went to a meeting of Václav Havel's opposition group in the private home. The meeting went on for a little while. The door suddenly fell in. There was a mob of secret policemen with dogs and searchlights and, and a video camera to catch us all on, on 
smash you up against the wall. You're coming with us. Where are we going? And what's the charge? We're not telling you what the charge is. I thought, shit, now I've got to mention Kafka. <laughs> they make you do it. It's compulsory. Well, when I'd um, spent some time in North Korea, where the head of state is the dead father of the current leader, Kim Jong-il, the dear leader, is head of the party in North Korea, the Korean Workers' Party, and he's head of the armed forces, but he's not head of state. His dead father is still the head of state forever. Makes it, I think, the, the world's first uh, necrocracy, <laughs> or morsolocracy, or thanatocracy. But uh, absent that completely insane detail, here's what it's like. There's a picture of him on every wall. There has to be a picture of him in every house. He is never off the, the television screen. He's never off the wireless, the radio. He, all films are about him, and all plays are about him. All education is about him. Um, all public events are about him. All holidays are about him. Um, and it's as if somebody in 1950, which is the year that George Orwell died, uh, in North Korea, had got hold of a copy of 1984 and thought, I wonder if we could make this work. <laughs> um, let, let's, anyway, let's have a go, because we've got these people locked up in this small country with Stalin and Mao on our northern borders, which aren't very long, with an, an, un, an uncrossable military frontier, uh, the, the demilitarized zone in the south, and the ocean on both sides, completely hermetic, already for a long time cut off from the rest of the world. We can do an experiment here. Maybe we could create a perfectly supervised, perfectly regimented, perfectly drilled society where everyone was the property of the state 24-7, as it were, where there was no, no respite. And um, I, I'd heard, of course, that you know, they do march the children to school carrying the picture of the leader, and they do do all this stuff. Uh, so when I first saw it, I thought, oh, yeah, that's right. I knew they did this. And then after a few days, I thought, they actually do do it. And they've, they've been doing it every day since 1950, and they'll be doing it after I've gone. Now, the promise of um, the authoritarian state, the state that says that you are state property, you, the citizen, belong to us, is that in return you will get, say, three meals a day, and your children won't starve, and uh, will be clothed, and so forth, and you'll be housed. That's the, that's the least you can expect for being pro state property. And for a considerable period of time in uh, some of the... Uh, Eastern European countries, a version of that promise was kept. It began to break down. Uh, and in China, too, a version of it was, was kept. It's broken down from time to time. And they've also now been replaced by capitalism. In North Korea, you're state property, but you're starving. It's a famine state. We don't know how many North Koreans died in the, in the famine of the, of the 90s, and it's impossible to find out. But it's several million. And the uh, average height of people in North Korea has shrunk by several inches. And of the younger generation, I mean, obviously the people didn't get any shorter who'd already fully grown, excuse me, but of the... Though if the regime could make that happen, it would certainly give it a try. Uh, but the, 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 the babies born in that period, the, the young of Korea, are much, much, much shorter than their South Korean counterparts, um, or their parents. And even though the regime makes every effort to show you only the good bits of the country, it can't stop you seeing from the bus as you go across country old people picking up individual grains of rice from the fields and people trying to eat grass. It's not possible to conceal a thing of this kind. So that the promise, as it were, has broken down. Uh, I finally had to eat a, a dog. I was so hungry myself. And I was a privileged uh, visitor and a protected guest in a privileged city of Pyongyang. Um, but I've, I finally had to have a pooch uh, for supper. They wouldn't tell me what kind. Um, I somehow wanted to know. Uh, it's a big dog, they said, as if that made it better somehow. <laughs> Don't ask for a doggy bag if you're in North Korea. <laughs> um, and I actually got thinner myself. I must go there more often, if you like. But it's, in other words, it's the perfect combination of evil, if you will. Uh, the, the concept of freedom is unknown. It's not just negated. It's not known. It doesn't exist. The concept of rights do not exist. But nor is there the most elementary provision or for education, uh, health, nutrition, and so forth. That's the best way I can put it. They ma managed to maximize the worst 
forms of all kinds of oppression, condense, refine, distill, and then again refine them uh, to make it the most miserable place in the history, perhaps, of the world, and certainly on the, on the face of the planet. At present, and as always with such countries, there's only one thing that does work, and that's the military and the police. And we know that the, the power projection made by the regime, the, the way it believes that it can sustain in itself and, and survive these rigors and these pressures, uh, is to use nuclear weapons either as blackmail or as, um, what would be the word, extortion. In other words, to ask for the food it can't grow to be delivered to its doorstep in exchange for empty promises about a possible future denuclearization. The, uh, here's how crazy it is, by the way. The USAID, when it gives out uh, bags of grain or whatever else it might happen to be, they insist on stenciling on the sacks a, a stars and stripes and a, so it says, a gift from the people of the United States. And it, it'll say it also in the local language so that the stuff can't be abused and so that people know that this is from America. Um, it's a small enough thing. The North Koreans don't mind handing it out like that at all. Uh, before it goes onto the black market, where it's usually bought up by the army and the party people, if it isn't um, who have first crack at it anyway. But they don't mind people in the starving, outlying cities seeing this because they say, you see, our leader is so much loved by the rest of the world that he's, and, and so much feared and so much respected that tribute is paid to him. And it comes even from the United States of America. And the people have no means of knowing that this isn't true. What I want to know is whether they can guess that or not. I'd give a lot to know what goes on in their minds, North Koreans are starting to defect now, very dangerous business, across the border from China. They didn't used to do that before. We'll see. But it's, it is not possible. I, I, cannot, I cannot deceive you. I, I cannot give you a direct account of what uh, is happening in the North Korean mind. But we will, I think, soon find out. At any rate, I would say that there was a, a very strong correlation, therefore, between the internal nightmare of the, of the ideology of the regime and the, the need on its part to impose itself on the outside world as well. These two things are not coincidental, they're indissolubly connected. Well, to Iran. Um, somewhat different. Uh, the regime has outlived, for example, the man whose portrait is indeed everywhere, the, the Ayatollah Khomeini. He has been dead since 1989. Uh, but the regime which displays his picture still goes on. It, it is still a theocracy built in the image of one man and on one rather particular interpretation of the, the rights of Shia uh, clerics to make laws. Um, it is actually a declining regime for that reason, because the generation of, of mullahs who imposed this revolution and the generation of revolutionary guards who actually imposed it by force is dying and moribund, and it's very clear. I went several times to the, the weekly Friday prayers that are still held at the university, the, the annual rally, the, excuse me, the weekly rally of the regime. And the, all the speakers were very elderly and often quite quavering. Um, and uh, the, the snowy bearded, if you like, rather than just white bearded and turbaned. There was a time, obviously, when it was very terrifying to live in Iran. You can, I can tell that because of a friend of mine who runs a bookstore. He's a big, tough guy, heavy set, brilliant intellectual, Kurdish, strong fellow. But every time anyone with a beard came into the store, there was a flinch in his eyes. Uh, he, uh, he would act nervously, and someone has put hide a book under the desk. Or he'd, he wasn't all that terrified when I saw him, but he was a man you could, you could tell had lived under a reign of terror. Uh, when you've met someone who's been through that, you'll always be able to recognize the symptoms. It must have been very bad. I know this is true also from female friends of mine there, was, who were terrified that if they let one strand of hair show under their hijab, uh, they ha would have acid thrown in their face or perhaps be blinded by a blow from, from a truncheon, either from a policeman or from a, an over-enthusiastic uh, civilian. Um, and you can see the fear in people's eyes that goes on from that too, but this isn't really happening anymore. What is happening in, in Iran is very interesting. Uh, within, within the carapace of a theocratic state, uh, an almost completely secular society is being created. Um, this is for a ghoulish reason. The Iranian mullahs lost so many young people in the suicide waves that they sent against Saddam Hussein. The, the, the sending of gangs of schoolchildren and teenagers to, to clear minefields on the Iraqi border. 
uh, there's not enough room in, in large parts of Iran to bury the number of people that they killed. It's uh, large parts of the country just one big cemetery. Uh, they lost so many young people <laughs> that they had to pay Iranian mothers incentives. If you would agree to have three or more children, you could get quite a lot of subsidy and quite a lot of uh, help from, from the regime. They, they tried to breed quickly a, a new generation, as a consequence of which it worked, it worked out all right, but not in the way they expected. As a consequence of which it's estimated more than half the population of the country is under 25, and they all hate the mullahs. So it's what I call the baby boomerang. Um, <laughs> in Iran, and if you want to get a drink, which believe me, I did, um, I, I found a bootlegger at the airport when I arrived, as a matter of fact. If you want someone to come round to your hotel room or your apartment and bring anything else you might like, any other form of alcohol or drugs or pornography or any other kind of video or um, publication, you can do that very swiftly. It's, uh, I, I, the mullahs are powerless to stop it. And they may even, um, some of them, be profiteering from some of this illegal uh, black market uh, themselves. Um, there is a, a tradition uh, in Shia Islam, very, very firmly believed in by the devout. It, it's one of the many ways in which Shia Islam is quite like Roman Catholicism. It has 12 imams. Uh, one, of, one of them is still alive somewhere. He never died. Um, he's never left the earth. He's never left us. He will come back one day, and then we'll know. We will know uh, that the reign of justice on earth is about to begin. And some people thought Khomeini might be uh, the 12th Imam, but he was too pious a man to claim it. It's very blasphemous to claim it for yourself. And it may not be a Shia. And it may not be a Persian. We don't know. But the hidden Imam, they believe, is somewhere. Well, I overheard two taxi drivers discussing and one of them said, do you think maybe George Bush is the 12th Imam? <laughs> now, when things have gone that far, the authority of the mullahs, I think, can be said to have been fairly fatally undermined. These drivers won't stop for anyone with a turban. It's, it's remarkable you see it in the street. These guys just wave and wave, the cabs go straight by, and no one will pick them up. Uh, it's very widely said, it was very widely said to me, um, that they wished that there would be uh, an American military intervention. It was said to me most memorably by someone I know slightly, um, Hossein Khomeini, the grandson of the Ayatollah Khomeini, the only living male Khomeini in his, in his home in Qum. He said to me, we wish that there would be a, an intervention to remove the theocracy. You ask, well, why should Saeed Hossein Khomeini uh, want to remove theocracy? He's a mullah. It's because he's a, he's a genuinely believing and devout Shia um, person and a great admirer of Grand Ayatollah Sistani um, of Najaf in Iraq, where he spent a good deal of time lately. Um, and he believes that if it goes on this way, his, his religion will be discredited and that the Shia cause will be disfigured and defamed and discredited by, by forming a dictator. And he's right. It's led to the mass production of atheism among young Iranians. I slightly hope it goes on a few more years so the job gets really thoroughly done before it falls, which it will. Uh, if, it were, if we uh, were able to establish an ordinary timeline for ourselves, we would say, I think, that within 10 years, the generation of the dictatorship will, have, will die out and will somehow be replaced. It will be an organic, internal, endogenous process of self-transformation of Iran. Everyone has a satellite dish. Almost everyone has a relative outside the country. People travel. They all get the news. They don't bother with the official propaganda at all. Um, and they're ready to vote. And when they do vote, they always vote against the theocracy. It's just that there's a reserve government a secret state within the state that does not actually allow them uh, to take power. But unfortunately, again, there is another timeline that we can't overlook, which is the surreptitious acquisition of weapons of mass destruction and the sponsorship overseas of religious gangsterism. And it's not possible, I think, to allow ourselves with any um, insouciance to say, well, let's have another 10 years of that as well, while it gradually wears itself uh, out of existence. So once again, we're confronted with um, a people who are gifted, talented, useful, civilized people who are being denied all their rights, but who know it, and by a government that tries to stay in power by making threatening gestures towards its neighbors and towards the international community. This dilemma is evidently not going uh, to go away. Um, I have some thoughts about what might be done next about 
all of these things. And I think probably the moment has come when I've spoken enough in my own voice. And I'd be as interested to hear from you if you have any thoughts about this as I would be willing and eager to um, take any of your questions. So, with thanks very much again for coming. Um, I'm all yours. Thank you. I was asked to confirm that I'd heard from more people than I had not heard from the remark that they would, they would welcome in Iran a foreign, a Western, an American intervention to remove the mulocracy. And which I can confirm, yes, that's very commonly said. Um, and I was then asked, well, would that not destroy the emerging democratic opposition there? Would it not compromise it? Uh, the answer to that is probably that it would. Uh, I mean, th there are a lot of people who say they think... Well, actually, let me, let me step a little further back. I heard that said so often by people that after a bit it stopped delighting me. In other words, um, in a way it's a confession of weakness on their part. It's a confession of impotence. It's a sort of resignation. We can't do anything ourselves. There's also something slightly servile about it, and a mentality of that kind, of course, would, could turn on a dime. Right, right away, if there was an invasion, people would, if they got what they wanted, they'd suddenly say, down with the occupation, to show that they could be brave after all, as has happened with quite a number of Iraqis. Now that they can show their courage, they do. Um, they, they, it's partly because of the, the shame they feel that the cowardice and conformism before. And one doesn't want to upset this febrile balance too much. Um, and one does hope to encourage an, uh, an, an internal movement, but every time an internal movement has been tried, it's been very brutally put down. So that, given the odds, given the very heavily armed goons with which the regime maintains itself, one is condemning people to a much longer period of servitude, and one is also exposing the international community to a much greater risk of yet of a promiscuous state with weapons of mass destruction. Well, therefore, I think everyone has to reason it and realize that there are the, we are accepting a responsibility either way, and that doing nothing is also a policy. If the EU's talks with Iran don't go well, do you see Israel intervening unilaterally like they did uh, in Iraq, in a Syriac? And if so, what, do you think, what effect do you think that'll have on the, the growing movement against the mullahs in Iran? Well, it couldn't be unilateral, for one thing, because they'd have to cross Iraqi airspace, and no one would think that um, that had happened without Iraqi or American permission. So. Uh, it, the, it, no one could say, uh, oh, that was the Israelis, we don't know anything about it. In any case, people who think like that in the Middle East regard Israel as an American surrogate in any case. So there is no such thing as Israeli unilateralism in this matter. The best evidence that I have, but, but I'm open to be challenged about this, is that the Israelis, as among others, have concluded that the, the bombing of the Iraqi uh, reactor in 82, I think, um, 81, um, I've just forgotten the name of the reactor. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, Ozirak, the Ozirak, um, o Oshirak, as I call it, because he built it for Saddam Hussein, um, knowing what he wanted it for. There's another unilateralist at the UN for you, by the way. Um, only retarded um, and may in some ways have advanced the Iraqi nuclear program because it, it, dro it just drove it further underground. That, I've heard many Israelis say that. I've heard some other... Um, experts in the, f in the field of disarmament say that good shot though it was, it, it didn't really denuclearize Iraq. And, we, and the Iranians in any case, as we all know now, have configured themselves so that it would be much harder to have their, the core of their program taken out in any one place or in any one day. So that's why I insist on the linkage of internal democracy um, and emancipation with these questions. The, there are only two serious countries that have ever got this near to getting a bomb or got one and given it up, the Brazil and South Africa, in both cases as the result of a democratic revolution that replaced the dictatorship that uh, embarked on the program. And so I, what one has to hope for, I think, is that we will, we will get, get into a position where we, we will be negotiating on disarmament with democratic Iranians, not theocratic ones. So now, well, Iran is a poor country, and a lot of people are very poor uh, in the outlying parts of it, but it is enormously more developed infrastructurally than Iraq. It's really quite 
and the roads are excellent, the internal airline flights are very good. The traffic jams in Tehran often go on for four days, but that's a sign that most people have a car. Everyone has satellite dishes and so forth. Everyone's accustomed, more or less, to living in an open society. Uh, almost everyone has a relative in a democratic country. Uh, there have already been elections, it's just the, the, the mulocracy won't let the winners take office. Um, so all of that work has, so, so to speak, has been done in advance, and as far as I could tell, there's no sectarian or confessional problem in Iran. 92% uh, Shia. Uh, there are, uh, even the um, existing theocracy has reserved seats for Jews and for Christians who are quite small but significant minorities, mainly Armenian, the Christian, in the Majlis, in the parliament. They're recognized and their rights are, so to speak, at least acknowledged, if not actually observed. There's certainly no dislike for Jews or Christians. It's very dangerous to be a member of the Baha'i faith, because that's post-Islamic, not pre. But other than that, there's nothing of this sort. Um, the Kurds are a very small minority. They're not separatist. There's no, there isn't having any fighting there for some time. What, help, what have I left out? Not everyone is, everyone speaks the same language. Everyone speaks Farsi. Not everyone is Persian. It may be as many as 30% are Azeri. Uh, not, not Persian. That, that, that's not an issue. Nobody would pull a knife over it. So all you need to do, if I lower my voice here, okay, I have no right to say any of this. But all you need to do is what a woman in a Shador said to me in Isfahan. The only one woman I met actually in a Shador who hated the regime so much but she, she said, if the Amer do you think the Americans could come and only stay for about a week and then get out? And I thought, well, what a brilliant idea. I'll pass it on. You know? so, several of the Iranian government have wanted men in Europe and elsewhere. We, we know the names of the people who sent out these death squads to Berlin and elsewhere. Go and arrest them. You're gone. You're nicked. The rest of you are up against the wall. Um, we're going to blow up that tunnel that you thought we wouldn't find out about in the mountain near Isfahan. There are a couple of other places we don't like the look of, because, you know, we found out you can only really inspect a country by really paying it a proper visit. And um, then we return the country to its people and go home. Think about it. Think about it, because that's what they're thinking about. I don't know that the United States is thinking about this, but a lot of Iranians are thinking about it. It, would, would, it wouldn't need to be this stewardship, guardianship, wardship that we have to have for the Iraqi people after what they've been through. Around the time of the first Gulf War, you wrote an essay where you described uh, U.S. policy in the Middle East as uh, mutually assured destabilization. Uh, do you see the invasion of, the Iraq, of Iraq as like the ultimate repudiation of that policy, uh, a, a reversal where now the U.S. is looking to create sta stabilization? Well, uh, it, would be, it would be nice in a way to be able to say that, and it would be symmetrical. Uh, but not quite. I think what I was referring to was the way that the United States sort of managed to be on both sides of the Iran-Iraq war. And, and was different factions of the administration were dealing with it covertly as well and arming both sides. And you had the feeling that as well as that element of profiteering, there was also a Kissingerian mindset. In fact, Henry Kissinger did more or less say, hey, this is a great war. I wish, I wish they could both lose. That was his comment on this war that killed perhaps two million people. And, you know, it was seeing two enemies go at each other. Um, which is, of course, why the, everyone, more, more or less everyone in Iran, believes that Saddam Hussein was instigated by the United States to attack, which is actually a half-truth, a bit more than half-truth. So, yes, the, the, this policy is partly, was partly, we have to undertake it because of the failures of the previous one, because the, that was such a disastrous policy. And second, we ought to put right some of what we did. But I can't exactly say that it's a stabilizing um, policy, because in, in one way, it was to say that the status quo in the Middle East should be overturned. Uh, that's why I feel that some of my uh, friends in Washington are unjustly referred to as neoconservatives. In other words, the conservative, they're not at all. They're, these are people who oh, said, no, we don't like the status quo. We don't like the way things are. We, we, we're willing to take the risk of destabilizing it because we, we're sure that any alternative would be better. That's not really a conservative position. The conservative position was taken by George Bush Sr., by Lawrence Eagleburger and Brent Scowcroft and some other senior statesmen, grouped usually around Henry Kissinger, who, the real politic view of the world that says, no, we, we like to treat the region as if 
it was um, something that we could rule through proxy dictators um, and not have to worry too much about the opinions of the unwashed. What do you see happening in Iraq over the next five years? Well, um, it was interesting when I asked Iranians what they thought about the Iraqi elections and the process there, for the most part, they, they pretended a sort of indifference. This, this comes largely from the feeling that don't talk to us as if we were Arabs. Very strong feeling there. They resent very much being thought of as Arabs. Um, do not imagine that they have anything to learn from an Arab model of any kind. And regard Iraq not as a nation, but as a state, as a recently cobbled together political entity, uh, not a wonderful millennial highly evolved civilization like the Persian one, which is 2,000 and more years old. I mentioned that because, of course, the main problem with Iraq is that it's precisely that. It, it isn't really a country. Um, th there is Iraqi nationalism, though. And I, I, what's going to happen over the next five years is a, a competition between that feeling of nationalism and other feelings of national, ethnic, or confessional allegiance. I don't think it's at all obvious that there won't be a compromise, a federal compromise about that. The one reason I believe it is because the groups are evenly, fairly evenly matched. The, the Kurds who are Sunni are about 20%. No one's ever going to try and rule them by force again. And they also have an army of their own now. They can't, no one's ever going to be able to bully them again. The same is more or less true of the, the Shia. Um, and the, and the numbers of the Sunni are too large to allow them to be treated as a despised minority also. That's the first thing. The second is I have never met an Iraqi who is 100% um, Shia, Sunni, or Kurdish. That's not quite true. I have met some Kurds who hardly have any non-Kurdish relatives because there's been... Uh, Kurdistan was governed separately, as you know, under the no-fly no zones. It wasn't ruled by Saddam Hussein. It wasn't part of Iraq for the last few years. But otherwise, it's a standard rule. You meet someone in Baghdad, they ask you to dinner, and you meet their Kurdish brother-in-law and their Shia auntie and so forth. That's Iraq 101. It's the reason why most of the, of the predictions about civil war have not proven to be true, and why there's been so little individual fratricide in the country or revenge taking. So that's what I think will happen. I think it will take, I don't know if it'll take five years to destroy the insurgency. I think it'll probably take less time than that because it's based on a minority of a minority. It doesn't have a state that can resupply it. It's, it's operating on the stolen resources of the previous regime. And because it's linked to another doomed organization, Al-Qaeda. And because it's uh, up against a military superiority of a kind that you've, you wouldn't believe until you've actually seen it. Uh, there's the most over I don't know why, in fact, it's called an insurgency at all. It annoys me that such a flattering term is used for such a sordid and um, evidently a self-defeating operation. You may know um, something I don't about the, what causes anti-American feeling or anti-Western feeling in the Middle East, um, but I don't think it's uh, Western intervention. I mean, I think that's giving a free pass to the Al-Qaeda mentality. You should take them seriously. You should, you should see what really does constitute their grievance. I can tell you, well, you know what, it, what their grievance is. What makes them angry? What makes them want to kill? Uh, the sight of a female face, for example. Or a Shia Muslim. Or a synagogue. Or a skyscraper. Uh, or a Christian. Or a Hindu. Particularly the Hindus. That's what makes them angry. Now, I'm, f I'm sorry, I have no patience whatever or at all with people who say that what brings them about is resistance to them. For one thing, it's not true. For another, it euphemizes their actual propaganda, which I've just delineated for you, which, as you know, is unarguable. You can read for yourself what their complaint is. And for the third, it would have to mean surrender. If resisting them only makes them more, more active, then we might as well give up now. They've won, haven't they? Well, they're not going to win. And their popular base is going to be tested for them. They didn't even run in the Afghan elections, and I can tell you what would have happened to them if they did. They didn't try to run in Iraq, and I'd tell you what would have happened if they did. They're not going to run in the Lebanese ones, and I can tell you what would happen if they did. Why are you being a ventriloquist for them and saying that their appeal is growing? And why do you imply that it's the resistance to this fascism that brings it about? This is defeating the mind. Drop it, I would. I'd, I'd just stop saying that.
I didn't hear your entire lecture, so I don't know if you discussed Syria at any point. No, but I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, they're kind of a question mark to me because I, I have the impression they're basically a secular government, and um, I wouldn't see them as a nation as be uh, part of a movement to be uh, you know, espousing a sort of an Islamic type uh, movement around the world, but they're always being accused of harboring insurgents. You know, they're accused of harboring Iraqi insurgents and helping them train and so forth. Yeah. And uh, also this issue with Lebanon, I don't remember hearing anything about this, and all of a sudden, now they have to leave Lebanon immediately. I kind of don't understand what's up with that. Right. Well, just for, for, for a start, um, a word on this Ba'athist secular question, which comes up a lot. There are two things you have to bear in mind if you're going to say that this is a secular policy. Um, the first is that it's explicitly based, and you can look at, I have, you can look up the, as I have, the original writings of the founders and inspirers of the, of the Ba'ath Party, and they modeled themselves basically on European fascism. I don't think European fascism was a Christian movement exactly, though it did have the support of the Vatican. I don't think, I think it's a bit much to call it secular somehow. But it's only in, in that sense, at any rate, that one can call it secular. It's, it proposes instead the worship of the state, of the party, and of the leader. And it's, certain, and it's not against religion in the least. In Iraq, uh, the Saddam Hussein regime, in its closing 15 years, mutated completely into an Islamist regime. It changed all of its rhetoric to jihadism. It began to build, uh, spent a fortune on building mosques, including the largest mosque in the world, the Saddam Hussein Mosque, profanely named centerpiece, a Quran, miniature Quran written in his own blood. I don't know if it was his own blood. It's blood all right, though. Um, he was, he's, his, the pictures and statues of him started to take the form of showing him in clerical robes. Uh, the verse of Allahu Akbar, not the verse of the Quran, but the, the um, slogan, Allahu Akbar, was put on the Iraqi flag where it had never been before. And they were sponsoring uh, all over the world um, Islamist, uh, not secular movements, no, notably supporting the Islamic Jihad forces in Palestine against the secular PLO, and paying, I'm saying paying personally for every suicide bomber who, would, who, would, who was known as a martyr in the Ba'athist press, just as the nuclear scientists of Iraq would call in the Ba'athist press our nuclear mujahideen, which is a wonderful expression, I think you'll have to agree. Um, and it was based on the tribal minority of the Sunni, now, obviously, someone who doesn't want majority rule when the, when, when the majority is Shia Muslim has every reason to pretend to be a secularist and not, and not say, oh, no, I'm not a sectarian. It's not that I want to protect my own Sunni Muslim tribe. But don't be fooled by this, and don't be fooled by it in Syria either. The Syrian government is a completely religious re regime. It's based on the uh, Al Alawite minority, which is a very small minority in, in Syria. It's a religious clan. It rules. That's not secular. Um, if you want me to ask to say what Alawism is, I can tell you only really that it is a, um, a form, a variant of Shia Islam, a rather individualized form of it. Uh, but this minority rule in Syria is breaking up and hasn't long to last. But while it does last, there's no question that it sponsors what you say it does not sponsor, um, namely uh, clerical terrorism around the world. Its main ally is Iran. Its main trading partner and armorer is Iran. It's just made a formal military agreement with Iran, and with Iran it co-sponsors Hezbollah, which happens to be conveniently a pro-Syrian party, and it's currently uh, in the current crisis in Lebanon, where you say, where's all this come from? Why are they suddenly being told to get out of Lebanon? Well, because the people of Lebanon have had enough of it, because there was an election coming. There is one coming in May. Uh, because a force was being put together out of diverse groups, the, the Druze, led by the, the Socialist Party leader, uh, Wally Jumla, many of the Sunni, the Christian, uh, probably majority of Lebanon, and, and others. And Mr. Rafiq Hariri was going to join this coalition, and if he'd done so, it would have been very hard for it not to win. So, like everyone else who's ever criticized Syrian rule in Lebanon, he's been murdered. I don't say the Syrians did it, I say that that's what always happens to people who criticize Syrian rule. Um, those are the facts. Uh, that's what happened to the previous head of the Socialist Party, Kamal Jumla. That's, I think, why you'll find uh, that suddenly, all of a sudden, in a way that seems to have upset you, I'm sorry, um, they're being told their time in Lebanon is up and they should go, as they should. 
few a week ago, Russia proceeded with its agreement uh, with Iran to provide them with uh, enriched uranium. They're also supplying um, mid-range missiles to Syria. And this is all following a brief meeting with the president uh, about two weeks ago in Europe. Uh, there's criticism on both sides of the aisle that uh, the president blinked um, during this meeting. And I was hoping to gauge your thought and opinion on where is the U.S. relation, uh, where are the U.S. relations heading with Russia, particularly uh, with respect to the Middle East, and um, and and what are we essentially looking at? Are we again looking at uh, a stare down with Russia, or uh, do you hope that the situation will will come around because the sentiment is for democracy is too great? The stupidest thing that I think that George Bush has ever said. Some might laugh at this point and say, how long are you going to go on before you pick one? But actually, I think he said many quite shrewd things, including about the axis of evil. After all, think what we've been talking about just now. Who says he wasn't right to say that was an axis of evil? Nobody says that now. Every, everything we found out about those countries was much worse than what we thought, for most people to find out. Anyway. However, I should say the stupidest thing the president said was he, as, as soon as he saw that Vladimir Putin was wearing a crucifix around his neck, he knew he was a man who could be trusted. I have garlic under this, so uh, in case you're wondering. And he looked him in the eye and he knew he was a, a great man. And, I mean, I thought, oh, God. And so that's what you, that really is what you get uh, if you're faith-based. You get a KGB weasel as your partner. And it's too late to say that you think he's no good after you've endorsed him in that manner. Now, since that time, um, Mr. Putin... Uh, intervened outrageously in the, in the attempt of the people of Ukraine to make a self-determined government of their own. I, I do not believe, I say it flatly, I do not believe anyone in the Ukrainian KGB would have dared to try to poison the opposition leader if they thought the Russians didn't know or might disapprove. It is not possible in that milieu for the approval of Putin, at least negatively, not to have been sought. And I think that question should be asked much more aggressively than it has been. Um, Mr. Putin's policy of unilateralism in, in respect of Iraq at the United Nations, putting Russian interest, or the interest actually of a clan of Soviet mobs, former Soviet mobsters who are owed a lot of money by Saddam's regime and who were trading on the oil for food program, which was largely run through Russia, was scandalous. That's, that's unilateralism at the UN, not what the United States was doing, which was trying to get the existing resolutions enforced. Um, and yes, now Syria and now Iran. And they're very unhelpful about North Korea, too, and dragging their feet on an agreement we've had for a long time. I, I'm sorry I keep saying we. Um, I was in America this morning, and I'll be there again tomorrow. Uh, you'll pardon that. Um, uh, to, to build down the existing nuclear stocks, which, a lot of which are still targeted and still, still in the silos. And that should have been done years ago, and it hasn't been. Um, and this is, this is to say nothing about how he doesn't let the Russians interfere in their own internal affairs which he does not. I mean, he's, he's quite clearly involved on a course of one man and one party rule for his own country. So this is extremely dangerous. And it shows that there has been a great Russian chauvinist resentment ever since the events of 1989, the feeling that they are on the losing side and that they're being a victim, becoming a victim country. This, I think, is incalculably dangerous. You mentioned three very repressive regimes of which one, uh, the United States, intervened in Iraq. Uh, are you justifying also that uh, the United States or whoever should also invade um, Iran, North Korea? And on that basis, if your answer is yes, I mean, who becomes the arbiter and what is the criteria then for not invading Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. Egypt, uh, whatever repressive regime? If you return me to the question of um, uh, quo, quo waranto, the old question, by what right, which must be asked of everything. Um, as you know, there are four conditions under which a government can be said to have sacrificed its sovereignty and to have put itself outside international law such that the United Nations can, can contemplate uh, removing such a government or intervening in its internal affairs at least. These four are the following. Um, invasion or invasions of neighboring states or occupations of neighboring states. Um, violation of the Genocide Convention, which mandates action both to prevent and to punish it from all the signatory powers, of which Canada and the United States are. One, two. Um, 
violations of the Treaty on Nuclear Non-Proliferation, the NPT, um, and uh, sponsorship of international terrorism. Now, any of those four qualify you to, to ask uh, for any member of the Security Council to uh, ask the United Nations to consider taking action. Well, with Iraq, that's easy. All of those four violated repeatedly, serially, flagrantly. Got away with a lot of them, should have probably been arraigned earlier than they were. Iraq was not a sovereign country um, in 2003. It was under international sanctions already. Um, large parts of its airspace were patrolled by American and, and British planes. It didn't have really control over its own borders. It was, a, it was an outlaw state in, in law. Iran um, only qualifies under two of these at present, it seems to me. It doesn't threaten any neighboring country, unless you say that its alliance with Syria helps perpetuate the occupation of Lebanon. Technically, it does. It's been fooling around with the NPT, but it is constantly in negotiation, and it is submitting to inspections. Um, and it does sponsor international terrorism. Um, but in, in, I would say in the most ambiguous form, in that Hezbollah is not, a part, is not like Al-Qaeda or Islamic Jihad. Hezbollah is a, is a Shia political movement with a, with a military wing. Um, and it's, there, would be, there would be some argument in, in, in the United Nations, I think there should be, as to whether or not it qualifies as a terrorist organization, purely, purely and simply. I would say that it did not. So this is very difficult. Um, North Korea commits genocide only against its own people, not others, but it does do that. It's a political policy of starvation. Um, it's in flagrant breach of all, the agree all agreements on non-nuclear weapons. And it plans to invade South Korea. It maintains itself on invasion footing at all times. Um, so you would be as good a judge as I, but these are the criteria. And as you'll see, it should get people to stop doing this rather annoying thing. If one, one makes a case against Saddam Hussein as carefully as one can, they say, well, why don't you go and invade Robert Mugabe then? I, I hate it when people do that. Don't do it. Please, don't do that. It's my understanding that back in the 1920s, when Ibn bin Saud was trying to create his uh, personal state in post-Ottoman Arabia, he made a deal with the Wahhabists, saying that if you support my political agenda to create the state of Saudi Arabia, I'll support you and your education programs and allow you essentially free reign within my territory. Uh, now fast forward to 2005, now you have Al-Qaeda and all these groups that spring from Wahhabism and you have the United States that's now pressuring autocratic regimes in the Middle East to democratize. And my specific question is this, is it still in the House of Saud's best interest to support the Wahhabists and their educational institutions within Saudi Arabia, essentially their domestic forces? Or is it now that, to use a totally politically incorrect term, they feel that they might have made a deal with the devil and that now they're having all these pressures from the United States and they're essentially walking tightrope? So I just want to know your answer on that. Um, but I, by the way, I don't think there's anything politically incorrect in saying deal with the devil. Your, your uh, analysis of it is, as far as I can see, uh, flawless. As far as I know, that's exactly what did happen, and it's also exactly the question that they are having to confront. Is it worth it? Because they've invested billions of their petrodollars in creating madrasas for the inculcation of a very fundamentalist version of the Quran um, in Indonesia, um, in Algeria, in, in some parts of Turkey and uh, Africa, Nigeria, which I think is the next place where there's going to be a confrontation of this kind, by the way. Um, I think we should be paying a lot more attention to Nigeria than we are doing. And also in, um, in the United States and Canada, uh, where very often now this, the Wahhabi version of the Bible, which explicitly, see, of the Quran, the holy book, which explicitly um, endorses and calls for violence against uh, unbelievers is being used by imams in our prison system. I mean, that's not uh, mince words here. There's an attempt being made to build a secret army within Western society out of uh, criminal elements and to supply it from outside and to keep it and to give it uh, a re uh, an ideology that would really discipline it. And this has to be taken very seriously. Um, I think that uh, the Bush administration has been hopelessly laggard on this question. The president has never used the word Saudi Arabia in the same sentence as the word terrorism. He's used the word terrorism a lot now. I think just by, you know, 
churning around, one day the word Saudi ought to turn up in the same. It just doesn't seem to do it. He's used it in conjunction with almost every other word. So that he makes it sound like tourism now every time he speaks. Um, that's how we hear him say the war on tourism. <laughs> well, which I wish also would break out. Um, I think he should say very plainly to them that there will be not one more school uh, or institution that's open with Saudi money on American soil unless uh, churches, uh, synagogues, Shia mosques, and centers of atheist humanism can be legally open in Saudi Arabia. If they don't say yes to that, it's over. Finish. And the worst will follow. But we cannot have a situation where they're training guerrillas in uh, schools in the United States and, and in the prisons and trying to do it in the army uh, under the protection of the First Amendment. And, and it's illegal to be a Christian in Saudi Arabia. It's illegal to be an atheist. It's illegal to be a Jew. And it's very nearly illegal to be a Shia. Though one of the very good things that has been happening lately is the signs of stirring among the Shia people of Saudi Arabia who happen to do the heavy lifting um, in the oil fields and do all the stoop work down there. And they're beginning to get ideas out of Iraq. And I hope we're encouraging them to do so and make life hell for the, for the kingdom and for the Wahhabists, where they live every day. Do something mean to them. What is the real relationship between China and North Korea? And could the Chinese impose change there? The answer to that is certainly that they could. I mean, part of the reason for the collapse of the North Korean economy was the collapse of communism in China and Russia and the end of the traditional um, subsidies that had been given to them. Um, that plus their own fantastic agricultural incompetence. And the Chinese uh, control most of the avenues through which trade goes in and out of uh, North Korea. And <clears throat> there is also, uh, on the other side of the Tumen River that separates the two countries, there's a, a, a a, a Korean-speaking area in that province on the, on the border. There's a large sort of Korean-speaking minority, ethnic Koreans, in fact, in, in China, which gives them an interest because that's where the refugees are going. And obviously, China hopes that North Korea does not completely implode because if it does, the, the whole population will try and escape in, into China, facing them with a huge demographic crisis, a, a minority crisis that they don't need. So they're very interested in getting a soft landing for the regime. And this may explain why they seem reluctant to do anything very public. But they have a real interest on the, on the disarmament question, which is this. If North Korea carries on in the, with this promiscuous policy, it will almost certainly force the Japanese to declare themselves a nuclear power. The, Jap the Japanese, we know, have the resources to, and they, and they possess the knowledge to put together a nuclear weapon in a day. They just don't do it because their constitution forbids them to do it and because there's a very large public opinion that is, for obvious reasons, very anti-nuclear. But if you remember, when the Koreans last tested their long-range missile, the missile that they've been selling, by the way, to Iran, and were going to be selling to Saddam Hussein had he stayed in power, uh, they tested it without warning uh, by firing it across Japan. So it landed on the other side of Japan from the, in the sea. That's how the Japanese found out. Now, that, must, that does make them nervous. Because it means they don't have to ask the question, I wonder if they can reach us. Um, now, China quite obviously does not want a nuclear Japan. So you can do, you can do the triangulation of it very simply. It's in, obviously in China's national interest to keep Japan non-nuclear. So it, it, for them to do that, they'll have to make sure that North Korea becomes non-nuclear too. So it would be nice, I think, if the Chinese acknowledged that this was the fact. And we're not asking them to do us a favor. We're asking them to do themselves a favor, as well as, of course, the people of North Korea. My question, we were talking about negotiations and uh, your sticks and your carrots, and you were saying you need the other boot to kick them if they don't follow through. Well, <coughs> look back to the 94, the agreed framework with North Korea, and they broke it five minutes later. When we found out in the fall of 2002 that they weren't agreeing with it, what should have been the reaction? Come to the table again, and we'll negotiate from this point, or? Something else, the stick. Well, there's a hideous difficulty here, which you, you probably understand, some of at least, um, which is the same as the one I dwelt on with Saddam Hussein. We, we don't think that the mullahs are, I probably should have said a word about this. I don't, at any rate, think that the mullahs are mad in Iran. I think they're quite cool, um, quite calculating, very cynical, very corrupt guys. They, they, they profit enormously from the present status quo. They'll do their best to hang on to it, but they're not they're not deranged, they're not delusional. That's my opinion. Their, their religion is partly 
it does make them believe and do some very stupid things that often are against their self-interest. But that's what religion does. You know. um, they, they, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not as toxic as Wahhabism. With North Korea, though, there's every reason to think that there is an element of insanity, not just in the leadership, but in the very system itself. It's set up to drive people mad. And thus, it's very difficult to calibrate a reward and punishment system with them. And um, I've been on both sides of the demilitarized zone of, of Korea now. It's a huge concentration of violence. Um, and the problem is that the capital city of Seoul, the capital city of South Korea, is about an hour's, maybe two hours drive. It's very near the border. And it's a huge city now. And it's also the capital of flourishing democracy now, after a long struggle. And it could be saturated with conventional fire from North Korea. And every time it's, it, that it's been war games, and I've been to some of these war games at the DMZ, you start with the losing Seoul. Without the nuclear question coming into... Now, if those North Koreans do that, of course, that's the end of their regime. And not just their regime, it's the end of the state. I mean, North Korea isn't, isn't a country. I mean, that would be the end for them if they did do this, but we would have lost our brothers and sisters in Seoul. Now, if the United States was the country that some people think it is, it would say, well, who cares? We don't live there, and Korea would never be a problem again. But we can't do that. We can't take that chance. Otherwise, you could send a squadron of planes over North Korea, and you could denuclearize it in an afternoon. That, that isn't a problem. And you could, in the best time to do that, it, some people argue, would be right now, before the reactors, reactors fully come on stream. But we, don't, we, can't bet, we can't bet that they wouldn't destroy themselves in an attempt to destroy us in the process. And that, it's morally not possible to take that chance. <coughs> and if you refuse to pay any more tribute to them, uh, from, on the extortion side, leaving the blackmail part for the moment, going moving to the extortion side of it, you say, right, we're not going to give you any more food. You know who's going to go hungry, and it's not going to be Kim Jong-il. And again, it's morally very difficult to say, well, we hate you so much, we'll starve your population. Especially where we now have the full record of how abysmally the United Nations are exploited and fleeced the people of Iraq. That was blood for oil, by the way, if you want a slogan. <laughs> too kind, too kind. Thank you.